Good day. I'm Martin Gago with Market Radius Research. It's Wednesday, December 22nd, and we've got CEO Grant Connolly of New Path Health. New Path is a vertically integrated healthcare provider providing uh, pain management and other treatments and services. I've got Grant on the call today for uh, several reasons. Pain management is a growing field with high needs from patients. And the company has some strong backers. The healthcare services space is fast growing and critical, and I see a lot of opportunities here. But remember, this is neither recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company, do your own due diligence, and come to your own investment conclusions. Grant, thank you very much for taking the time with us. Now, please tell us about uh, New Path. Thanks for having me on, uh, Martin. So I will get past the legal disclaimers. Uh, as Martin mentioned, we are a vertically integrated uh, healthcare company focused on pain management and MSK conditions. Really, our goal is to improve access to care for patients um, suffering from MS MSK conditions and also improve outcomes for patients suffering from MSK Grant. conditions. Sure. Sure. Jeff, what is MSK? Thank you. It's, uh, it's musculoskeletal. Um, so, so really, you know, anything involving the, the, the structure of the, uh, of the body, um, kind of all encompassing, um, really, uh, and I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later, but, um, it is, um, chronic pain falls into that category and chronic pain is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Um, and MSK conditions are actually the biggest driver in terms of, uh, health spend for organizations. So it doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, but it's actually a really big problem and it's a, it's a growing problem. And, and that's why, that's why new path exists. Um, so in our, in our network of clinics, we treat patients who have chronic pain, as I mentioned, uh, acute spinal injuries, um, sports related injuries and, and concussions. And we have a blended care model. Uh, a lot of health or healthcare organizations were forced to move to a, a blended care model over the, the, the course of the pandemic basically just means that we see patients in person in our, in our clinics, uh, as well as uh, offering virtual care to, to patients. So we, we have the largest um, national pain clinic network. We have 15, 15 clinics where we have a controlling interest and two other clinics where we have a minority interest. And our focus in those clinics is to, is to operate or offer interdisciplinary care. And that's really what makes us different. Um, Healthcare in general, we, we, we tend to, patients tend to receive care in silos. So, you know, in, in the case of our patients, they might be seeing their family doctor, they might be seeing a physiotherapist, a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, maybe a psychologist, as well as, as, well as a pain care physician. Um, and none of, those, none of those different healthcare providers are really talking. Um, and, you know, to, to, to non-healthcare people, it, it, it seems obvious, you know, and those people should be talking and they should be working out the best um, healthcare plans for, for patients working together. It doesn't really happen in healthcare and that's what we're trying to change. And that's what interdisciplinary care. So within our roster of healthcare providers, we have um, physiatrists, we have anesthesiologists, we have neurologists, we have a neurosurgeon. We have a number of different medical doctors from, from, you know, from different specializations, but then we also have allied healthcare providers like physiotherapists. We have some psychotherapists and, and really we're trying to offer patients that, you know, that collaborative care model. Um, and, and that's what makes us different. It sounds easy, but it's actually much harder to do. And, and as well, I'm not too sure about the whole spectrum of MSK issues, but um, I'm fortunate enough not to suffer from chronic pain, but I know some um, some people who have that and or as well some healthcare providers that target that um, specialty as well. And it's really debilitating for the people. It's not just for employers. It really improves. Like if you can control it or manage it, it the, the quality of life improvement is pretty massive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, put it put another way, it has, you know, it has a really big impact on, on patients' lives. And I, I think where we are is it's, it's very similar to where mental health was, um, you know, 10 years ago. And, and thankfully, we've seen progress in terms of mental health. But the attitude used to be, um, you know, just cheer up, right? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a big deal. Um, and, and with chronic pain, it's, you know, patients um, probably get the, get the, you know, just push through it, just tough it out. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about, uh, about, warriors and and I, I think that that talk is really detrimental to 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 uh to patients because it implies that 
um, you know, if, if they were just a little bit tougher, they, they could actually, they could actually get through it. And I think that, um, to your point, um, being able to help patients has a, has a massive impact on, on their, on their lives. Um, you know, they're, they're able to go to work, they're able to, you know, do stuff around the house that we, we take for granted, um, you know, go out and see friends and, and, uh, and, and do the things that they really enjoy doing. And, and that, that stuff tends to be taken away from our patients has a really big impact on their, on their lives. And, and the um, diagnosis it, and treatment, sorry to interrupt, it is highly complex. It may not show up on an x-ray or an MRI or in a blood test or anything. And, and the, I've got some pain in my back or something. And then they're, okay, you got to do physio exercise to treat that, maybe a little bit of Tylenol. But obviously, with the opioids, we see what happens if that gets out of control. And maybe a psychologist, like you were saying, to help sort of sort of stress management and, and other things. So it's, it's really one of those like if you break a leg, you know what to do. If there's chronic pain, you, you got to really uh, bring in all sorts of specialists or all sorts of different types of uh, uh, providers. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and what we see with our with our patients is that their journey before they actually before they actually land with a with a, a pain specialist is is long um, and involves you know bouncing around between. As you mentioned, you know their their family doctor prescriptions, um, imaging to to see if there to see if there's anything anything structural, um, and, and we're kind of the 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 end of the line, and we're we're working to try to change that because early intervention is is key with with most most issues in healthcare, uh, and so um, it is very difficult to diagnose. It's uh, it's subjective, um, but you know any patient who uh, is suffering from pain. For, for more for more than three months, whether they know that whether they know the cause or or not, um, should probably should probably seek out care, and and that's not, not med medical advice. I shouldn't be giving medical advice, um, but the the body um, with with injuries it, it it tends to tends to be able to heal itself within within those three months, um, and, and so any pain lasting lasting beyond that likely isn't as a result of result of an injury. It's it's probably it's probably some you know chronic pain related and and as well like with it if you let's say don't like and i don't want to get into healthcare. Uh, like if you don't deal with it the longer it goes on the harder it is to cure and like you get your neural pathways like oh i've got this pain you sort of identify as i'm a guy with back pain and the sooner you get to it the better it is right yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the unfortunate part is that um, the, the the more that our our, our body's danger alarm systems um, process process and transmit pain signals, the better they the better that they get at it. Um, and, and there's this this concept of um, it's called neuroplasticity. It's it's getting a lot more attention now, and it basically, um, in layman's terms, it, it's the ability to, to, to change the way that the brain functions, either, either for, for the good or, or for the bad. And, and we see that in chronic pain patients is, you know, the, the longer, the longer they're experiencing that pain, the more physiological changes their, their body undergoes, which become that much more difficult to reverse. So early intervention is key. And, and so, in those in, the, in those clinics, we we see over 140,000 patient visits annually. We have just over 120 licensed healthcare providers, and, and we're building out some really interesting technology that I'll get to. Um, so again, we have the we are the largest clinic network. So we have 15 um, 15 clinics where we have a controlling int interest plus uh, another two where we have a minority interest. Um, that blended care model. So everybody's everybody loves to hear about the virtual stuff. So right now we're seeing about 15 patient, fifteen percent of our total patient visits virtually. Um, we're never going to get to one hundred percent virtual, nor do I think it's appropriate. There's still a role for in-person care, and that's why that clinic network, those you know those, those brick and mortar clinics, is, is very important in the care delivery process. We can supplement it um, with, with virtual care, but there's still going to be a need for patients to come in person. Uh, in terms of numbers, we're, we're working off an annual revenue run rate of, of about $57 million. First nine months of the year, we, uh, we generate about $45 million of, in revenue. Um, and we're profitable. So we, we've been adjusted EBITDA positive for 11 straight quarters. Um, we're generating positive operating cash flow. So that means that we're not, uh, we're not using capital to, to fund operations. Um, we're, we're generating a little bit of capital. And so the cash that we have on the balance sheet, we can use to, to actually grow the business. 
Um, we have, you know, I, I feel very lucky because I have a number of different levers that I can pull on, or we have a number of different levers that we can pull on to grow the business. One of them is organic growth. Um, so we'll get into it a little bit later, but we look at capacity utilization within our clinics. And uh, capacity utilization is very similar to a hotel occupancy rate. So we've got some room to grow there. Um, and then there's a really big acquisition opportunity as well in the space. And sir, just to highlight, going back to that space, you have 15 clinics and you're the biggest provider, uh, operator of this in Canada. So to me, that says there's a lot of room for growth there. And uh, yeah, again, right now you're only in Ontario and Manitoba, you said? Uh, Ontario and Alberta. Sorry. Okay. Ontario and Alberta. All right. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, uh, as you know, the clinic space is, is still, is still really fragmented. We've seen, we've seen some consolidation, um, in Canada and the U S around primary care. Uh, so, so family doctors, we've seen some consolidation in the, in the U S around, uh, anesthesiology, but I would say that, uh, that interventional pain management is really one of the, the last, uh, or, or, really ha is, has yet to be consolidated. And, and when I talk about that, people say, ah, you're a roll-up. We're not a roll-up. There's, there's a reason behind, um, you know, growing the business other, other than just, just for the sake of growth. Um, and and the, the pathway to grow um, is, is much easier via acquisition. Um, we, we, we tend to think of clinics as, as retail businesses, and in some sense, they are. Um, and with a traditional retail business, you buy some inventory um, and then you go out and attract customers and you sell that inventory. It's much more complicated with a clinic because what you're actually doing is you're, you're matching supply and demand. So you're matching supply of physician services with demand for physician services from patients. Um, matching those um, can be very difficult when you initially open a clinic um, because it's very tough to attract patients if you don't have doctors to see those patients. Um, and, and likewise, it's tough to attract physicians if you don't have patients for those physicians to see. So by, by, by acquiring clinics, successful clinics, um, we, we skip past those chicken and egg issues. Um, and and there's, there's, there, there really is um, you know, benefits to that scale. When we're, when we're competing with, a, with a, a single clinic, that single clinic doesn't have the resource to invest in, you know, things like technology, um, you know, marketing, people and culture, the, the, the stuff that we've been investing this year to, to fuel f future growth. So it puts us at a real advantage to have that scale. So New Path was founded back in, in 2017. Um, we acquired a group of nine clinics, and then the following year, we group, acquired a group of uh, group of three clinics, and, and that effectively made us the, the largest pain network in, in Canada. July 2020, we started uh, straight, started trading on the on the TSX venture, and, and the go public exercise was really about being able to access capital and be able to being able to fund that fund that growth. Um, in November 2020, we closed an oversubscribe oversubscribed $12 million bought deal financing. Um, and then in, uh, in February, so there's a title here. In February, we acquired, um, we acquired Health Point, which was our, our, our first clinic outside of, outside of Ontario. So that's based in Edmonton. In, uh, in August, um, we reported our 11th consecutive quarter of positive adjusted EBITDA and also acquired Kumo Care. So Kumo Care is a virtual care business. Um, they have a telemedicine offering. As well as a, as well as a, a home care business that uh, that you know we, we think there's a lot of um, interplay between our patient population and 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 what they can do on the home care side. Um, November we announced our agreement to, or an agreement to open our second clinic in Alberta, and this is important. This is this this goes back to that we're not a we're not a roll up spiel that I gave you earlier. So you know people talk about acquisitions as platforms we actually do view acquisition, acquisition opportunities as platforms. And when we were talking to HealthPoint initially, um, they'd identified a number of, number of opportunities to grow, um, you know, and they, they, they either required capital or they, or they required a little bit of management expertise um, to, to, to push, those, push those opportunities further. This was one of those opportunities. So um, the, the, the clinic in Red Deer is unique. And that it's a it's a greenfield, and I told you that I don't like doing 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 green, greenfield clinics. But we we found a way to skip past some of those chicken and egg problems by partnering with a, a group of orthopedic surgeons. About 
80% of patients who are referred to orthopedic surgeons don't need to be seen by an orthopedic surgeon. It's kind of that, that gauntlet that our patients have to go through initially before they get, before they receive their diagnosis of chronic pain. So a family doctor will send them for imaging, send them to an orthopedic surgeon to rule out, rule out anything surgical. So by partnering with orthopedic surgeons, we can get access to those patients faster, or those patients can get access to our physicians faster. Um, you think about, think, about the, uh, think about our patient journey again, patient gets referred to an orthopedic surgeon. In Canada, they'll probably wait about six months to be seen by that orthopedic surgeon. And then they actually go for their appointment and they're told, you're not a good candidate for surgery. And they go back to their family doctor and start over. Um, whereas if our, if our doctors can see those patients, instead of kicking them back to the first, they won't have to wait six months. And instead of kicking them back to the family doctor, our, our physicians can actually provide them with a treatment plan. So it Im improves access to care for, for patients. And, and again, speeds that time to, speeds that time to treatment, which is really important for chronic pain patients. Right. Uh, so chronic pain, as, as we talked about earlier, it's a really big problem. It doesn't get the attention that, uh, that it, it probably should, but it, it actually impacts um, worldwide about one in five adults. In Canada, it's, it's one in four adults. So it's 20, 25% of adults in Canada. You likely know somebody who's suffering from chronic pain. I can tell you that I have people within my network, um, you know, family members, friends who suffer from chronic pain. Um, so it's, it's starting to get more attention. In the U.S., it actually costs over $635 billion per year. And in Canada, it costs over $40 billion per year. And what's driving the majority of those costs is lost productivity. So patients being able to, being unable to go to work, um, you know, having to take sick days, just, just not being as, as productive as they could be. It doesn't measure presenteeism. So that, you know, the cost associated with somebody being at work but not being as productive as they could be because they're, because they're in pain. Leading cause of disability worldwide, I mentioned that earlier, that's usually surprising to people. Um, and then we look at musculoskeletal conditions, um, the biggest cost driver in, in organizational health, health spend, and one in two Americans have a musculoskeletal condition. And just to be, I, I'm sure everyone's aware of this, but or, and I, I, this is actually a question. Like the opioid crisis, that's essentially driven off of people having some chronic pain or maybe some acute pain, short-term stuff, and then they keep using it. But like you use opioids too long and then you become addicted. That, that, that's a big driver of that, correct? And, and the mis prescri prescribing of that. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, opioids do work initially. They make the pain go away. Um, the, the, the problem is... You're not dealing with the the underlying cause of that pain, um, and, and so um, their opioids are great in the short term. So if you you know you break your arm, um, you're you're in pain, you take opioids for a short amount of time, it do, it does great. Um, the pro the challenge is when when you start taking them over over the long term, you build up a tolerance, and they're also highly addictive. Um, so there was there's a great study out of BC actually it looked at um, it looked at overdose deaths. And they found that uh, 55 percent of the of the, uh, the the overdose deaths in, in BC were people who were who were laborers or who worked in, in construction. And and so you take a step back and you you think about the narrative. So um, you know there's it's it's a it's a highly male dominated industry. Um, you know there there is there is some you know um, whether it's whether it's ego or testosterone, but it's you know pain isn't going to stop me, you know, I'm going to push through it, or I need to show up to work in order to be paid. And so, you know, somebody, somebody who's working on a construction site is much more likely to, to develop an injury. Um, and, and if they, they, they go to their, go to their family doctor, they get a prescription for, you know, Percocet or, or some other opioid. Um, it's great. It allows them to go to work. They, they can, they can show up and continue to, to earn a living, living, but over the long term, you know, you start to see that, that tolerance build and, and, and those addiction, addiction issues come around. So absolutely, there's, there's a big tie-in. And we actually have research coming out. Um, and I'm told that I'm not allowed to talk about this too much. But we can demonstrate that our treatments actually displace opioid usage. Um, and, and that's really big because when, when people hear about um, pain clinics or pain management, they initially go to opioids. 
Um, and that's not what we do. We actually offer opioid alternatives and displace opioid usage or actually help patients reduce opioid usage. Um, so there are a lot of people that suffer from, suffer from chronic pain um, and we have a physician shortage in, in Canada and the US. And it's, it's, not, just, it's not just related to, to pain or MSK conditions, it's, it's overall, but it's particularly acute for chronic pain patients. So in the US, there are about 30,000 patients per board certified pain care physician, um, which, is a, which is a huge number, far bigger than, than any, a far bigger roster than any, any physician can manage. Um, and so what it means is people that actually need care can't access that care. In Canada and in Ontario, the numbers are a little bit better, but a roster of 7,200 7, patients is still far too many for, for, a, uh, for a physician to manage. Um, and, and so what we're doing is we're, we're saying, um, how can we extend the capabilities of our, of our physicians in order to be able to offer care to more people back to back to what I said our, our mission was you know improve access to care for patients and improve improve outcomes for patients and so we look at our business in terms of strategic strategic pillars so technology and services is, is a big pillar um, so using things like virtual care um, using the remote pain management technology that we're, we're building out to basically extend the capabilities of our physicians or allow patients who, who couldn't come in, who can't come into clinic for whatever reason to be able to access that care where it's convenient for them. That interdisciplinary care that I talked about, again, extending the capabilities of physician by, by adding on other providers and also, also um, delivering better care. By, by using that collaborative model and then, and then using data-driven uh, evidence-based medicine. Um, you know, we have a ton of data within our, within our business um, and being able to unlock that data and access it and use it to develop better clinical pathways. Um, because right now what happens with chronic pain patients is that there is no standard treatment. Um, every single patient is different and our doctors will tell you they treat the patient, not the disease. Um, and, and so every patient really gets a bespoke treatment plan. Um, but there is there are insights within within the data that we have that we can we can tease out in order to be able to develop clinical pathways or at least give our physicians and healthcare providers a starting point to say, you know, for this type of patient, start start with start with this. Um, and, and, and so that's really important to us. We also own our own CRO. We don't talk about it a lot, but uh, but our CRO provides um, third party third yeah. What is a CRO? <laughs> it's it's a, a, essentially a, a clinical research organization. So they'll run studies for um, for pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, medical device um, ma de manufacturers, developers um, to to really um, you know test out the efficacy of the of the drug depending on what on which which phase they're in. So our CRO will do that. We'll offer services for um, you know Pfizer, Lilly. Um, other big pharma companies, but we also use a, those capabilities in house to to design studies, um, build out studies that we can use um, and run with our with our patient base to be able to say what impact um, are the treatments have the treatments that we're offering having on our patients. Um, really building out evidence. So in the in the chronic pain world, um, a big study is is about seventy five patients. We, have, we actually are, are in the process of publishing a, a 550 patient study. It was supposed to be a thousand patients, but COVID um, unfortunately cut our study short. We, we didn't feel like it was uh, appropriate to continue enrolling patients. So we cut it off at 550 patients, but using those capabilities internally, filling that gap in, in, in the research is, is really important to, to what we do. Not to I let the cat out of the bag, but what was the basic premise of the research study? Was it like a certain protocol of, of treatment or a kind of technology or drug or, 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 or what were you investigating? Yeah, it's, it, it was an observational study. It was, it was, uh, and there was a reason why it was an observational study. So we were, we were looking to see um, what impact the treatment, treatments that we offer our patients had on their, had on their daily life activities, their function, you know, is it impacting your ability to go to work? Um, you know, um, any of the other activities that, that you would do on a, on a daily basis. And so we measured it on that basis. Um, the challenge that we have is that we have um, patients that we're, that we're offering treatment. Um, and, and there's a bit of a, and this is, this is true for all research, there's a bit of, a, of an ethical dilemma 
um, in, in terms of withholding care from patients. So, you know, the, the gold standard would be the, the randomized control trial, um, the, the RCT. We can't do that with our patient base. We can't say, um, sorry, sorry, Mr. Smith, I know that you've been receiving treatment, but we're going to have to stop treatment for six, six weeks, have you go through a washout period, um, and then, and then put you potentially put you into, into a placebo group. Um, so what we had to do was, was essentially look at, you know, the impacts that, that we, that our treatments were having on our patients over time. Um, so the, you know, I can tell you, um, that, uh, that, you know, that reduction in opioid usage was, was one of the, was one of the key findings. Um, but also there were significant, um, improvements in, in daily function for, for a patient base as well, which is really important. That's what it's all about. Um, chronic pain is, is by definition, a chronic condition. We're never going to cure patients. All we can hope to do is, is, is improve their daily function and provide them with the tools that they need to better self-manage their, their, their condition. Great. Um, so I talked about the, I talked about the, the parallels between chronic pain and mental health. Um, you know, you can see them here stacked, stacked against each other, you know, from prevalence um, in the population, prevalence in the workplace, the economic burden, the employer burden, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of similarities between mental health and chronic pain with respect to, to, uh, to the workforce. Um, and, and what we've seen with, with mental health, thankfully, is that, you know, it's been destigmatized. There's still some work to work to do there, but, uh, but it, it, it has been destigmatized, um, and employers are investing in mental health care for their, for their employees. And the nice thing is that, is that we've, we've seen that employers are starting to realize that it's not a cost center. It's actually a profit center. So for every dollar invested in, in mental health, employee mental health programs, Canadian employers have generated a dollar 62 in return. Um, and for programs that have been running for more than three years, they've generated $2.18 in return. And you're probably saying, well, where is this return coming from? How are, how are they, how are they generating this return? And it's, it's simple. It's just, um, employers are, employees are more productive. Um, so they're, they're missing less time at work. They're not going on disability. They're more, they're, they're present and they're, and they're productive. And we believe there's a similar opportunity for uh, it within the chronic pain space, just because the just because the conditions are so similar, and outside of patients, the costs of of chronic pain are really borne by employers. I'm guessing that over the last two years, uh, mental health issues have been increasing as we're all locked up and have new stresses and strains. Uh, are you finding the same thing as well with chronic pain or I don't know, a, maybe it's stress driven or you can't get to the gym as often. So you're kind of, and you're eating cookies all day. And then all of a sudden your, your back hurts. Cause you, and that sort of, it, it, has you, have you, has there been a similar kind of, uh, has COVID impacted the chronic pain, uh, population? Absolutely. So they, there's uh, there's some pretty good studies now um, in terms of the the long term effects of of COVID and and there's you know there's a list of um, in one of the studies I think there are 50 different effects. Um, about 19 percent of people who who contracted COVID actually developed some sort of pain condition um, over the over the long term. Um, you know, and, and that's just, that's just the direct impact. You, you, you talked about the indirect impacts as well, you know, people being less active, um, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, not eating, eating as well as they, as they should. Um, those are going to, those are going to impact um, chronic pain as chronic pain as well. And, and so what do we do? I mean, we, we've talked, we've talked a while about, uh, you know, high level, um, but what kind of treatments do we act, do we actually actually offer, um, and how do we make money? Um, so the, you know the big thing is that we we try to offer as comprehensive um, an offering as, as possible. Um, chronic pain really is a biopsychosocial condition. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that it's not just driven by um, bio biological factors; it's also driven by psychological or behavioral factors, as well as as well as social factors. And so you can't, you know, back to the opioid example, you can't just take, you know, uh, a, a unimodal, and I, I don't know if, I don't even know if that's a word, but, you know, a single approach to trying to treat the condition, you have to, you have to, you have to come at it from a number of different angles and, and look at the, you know, the behavioral and, and social impacts as well. Um, so, 
you know, th these are, these are the, these are some of the services that we offer, you know, from assessments to, um, to injections, to diagnostics, like electromyography, um, you know, counseling, medication management, that's, that's where we see that, you know, the reduction in the opioid usage, um, it, as well as, as well as infusions. Um, we also offer physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is becoming a much bigger part of our practice. You know, the two clinics that we have a minority interest in are physiotherapy clinics, um, but we're also working physiotherapy more into, um, you know, our, our, our other clinics as well. Be able to provide that truly interdisciplinary um, offering. And then our chronic pain self-management program, um, something that we fund ourselves. Um, and basically what we're doing, or the goal of that program is to, um, it's a six-week program. It's to provide patients with the confidence and tools they need to better self-manage their pain. So have an understanding in terms of, you know, what impact is physical activity going to have on my pain? What kind of physical, physical activity can I do? What impact does sleep have on my pain? What impact does diet have on my pain? Um, there's also a huge social component to that. Um, you know, this, one of the things that doesn't really get talked about is that chronic pain patients live, tend to live a very isolated life. Um, so, you know, they're in the extreme case, they're unable to work um, because of their pain. Um, so that's going to create financial strain at home. They're unable to, to contribute as much around the household in terms of, in terms of work. So that's also going to create strain and resentment. Um, they're unable to go to, um, you know, attend social functions and, and go out and do stuff. And, and so they, they become, they become very isolated, um, you know, and, the, and that resentment also creates challenges because, um, you know, there's, patients feel like they, they're not understood by their family members. There, there isn't a good understanding in terms of, in terms of what they're going through. And so um, bringing patients together in groups so they can see there is somebody else who, who's like me that understands what I'm going through, that's going through the same things, has huge therapeutic benefits. Um, and what we see, what we see is that um, patients who attend a chronic pain self-management program together often develop friendships and they'll, they'll start to, they'll start to coordinate their appointment time so they can see each other, you know, on a fairly regular basis, you know, and go out for coffee afterwards and, and talk to each other. So there's, you know, that's how we're, that's how we're hitting chronic pain from, you know, from the behavioral or psychological and, and, and social perspective. Um, and, and so in terms of how we make money, um, these, these, uh, these different services are bucketed. Um, but basically, um, for every dollar that, uh, that our patients, our physicians bill um, on, you know, the, the services on the left side of the screen, 70 cents goes to the physician, we keep 30 cents. Um, and, and then on the right hand side of the screen, for every, every dollar that, that, uh, that physicians bill, 50 cents goes to the physician and 50 cents goes to the company. And that's because we're, um, we're investing in additional equipment, um, fluoroscopic guided injections. I'm going to assume that nobody knows what those are. Um, but basically fl fluoroscopy is, is like a, it's like a video x-ray. So, you know, a, a traditional x-ray, um, it's a still image. Um, this is a, this is a live image that our physicians can see on a screen. And as the patient moves around, um, the image changes. And so it, so it basically means that our physicians can be more precise with their, with their injections. Um, so, you know, requires an investment in, in the, the, um, the, fluoroscopy, the fluoroscopy equipment, as well as lead lining the walls. Um, so the, so the, the, the splits are a little bit different. I, I don't know if you're going to get into this later, but how much of this is typically covered by general public uh, health insurance versus private, like things like physio therapy, those are add-ons and aren't generally covered by sort of universal health. Um, is most of your business coming through getting paid to you by the insurance company or out of pocket or by the government? Yeah, the majority of it is, uh, is government pay. I think we're about 85% government pay and the, and the rest would be, you know, non-government um, third-party insurance or, or out of pocket. Um, there are differences in terms of the in terms of the fee schedules by province. Um, so in Alberta, there is an opportunity to, to bill for some physiotherapy services. Some some of them are covered by provincial health insurance. But you're right in general, um, they're they're not covered by uh, by um, provincial health insurance plans. Right. I won't spend a ton of time on this, but this just shows how. Um, how we're, we're, we're offering blended care and, and opportunities to, to supplement the, you know, the in-person care with, with virtual care. And so there are a number of different opportunities where 
um, we can we can supplement that in person care with with virtual care and really extend extend you know the the extend our reach beyond beyond our, our physical uh, you know physical clinics um, and that's really important. We see right now we see some of our patients will drive up to two hours um, to come to our clinics because they can't access these services um, where where they live. And, and so being able to to offer virtual care to those patients. Um, or, or other patients like them who can't drive those two hours um, becomes really important. So really extending extending the capabilities of our of our network. Um, so the remote pain management technology, I've talked about it a little bit. Um, again, musculoskeletal conditions are the biggest driver um, in terms of uh, in terms of organization organizational health spend in in Canada and the U.S. Um, do not get the same attention that you know conditions like diabetes, mental health. Um, cardiovascular diseases receive, but but MSK conditions are, are much much larger. Um, and, and so what we've done, I talked a little bit about our chronic pain self management program, is that we're we're working to um, build that so that patients can consume that um, on their on their phone. Um, and, and the reason for that is because um, we were limited in terms of and the, the pandemic helped um, in a lot of ways because. We couldn't. We had to stop offering the program because the idea of getting a group of patients together in a in a room together at the height of the pandemic just wasn't possible. So we had to put a pause on the on that program. Um, but also, we realized that um, by being able to use technology to deliver that program or a program like that with similar goals, we could we could offer it to to far more patients. So again, going back to improving access to care for for patients. Um, as well as improving outcomes. So what we're doing with our remote pain management technology is, is really um, the goal is to, to provide patients with the confidence and tools that they need to be able to better self-manage their pain. So they're guided um, educational pathways, um, you know, to, so the patients can understand how is my pain impacted by, by things like sleep, exercise, diet, um, you know, cannabis, um, meditation, you know, uh, a number of different educational pathways for, for patients to go down. Um, we're also going to provide patients with access to coaching. So being able to speak to somebody um, virtually when they, when they need to speak to somebody um, and, and better data capture. Um, one of the things that, uh, or one of the struggles that our physicians have is that um, you touch on this earlier, Martin, but you know, chronic pain is very subjective. It's not like you can go get a blood test and, and you, you know, you, Results are definitive. You, you either have chronic pain or, or you don't. It just it's just not reality. Um, and, and so our our doctors work in in kind of a data vacuum. They don't have a lot of data. And so being able to track changes in in you know patients' conditions um, over time, being able to share that back with our with our physicians or other healthcare providers in a consumable format um, is very important. So that enhanced tracking is is part of what we're part of what we're building out as well. Uh, so growth strategy, I talked about capacity utilization. Um, it's like a hotel occupancy rate. So we look at um, how well we're doing in terms of in terms of filling available physician shifts and how well we're doing in terms of filling available patient appointment slots. And we distill that down to a single number, which we call capacity utilization. So we're at 65% right now in our existing clinics. We can't quite double our revenue by, by filling capacity, um, but we can come pretty close. So that's a there's a big organic opportunity there. Um, and, and they're, you know, below um, are the levers that we can we can pull on. So adding services. So I talked a little bit about fluoroscopy. Um, right now we have six fluoroscopy suites either built or being built. Um, at the beginning of the year we had zero. Um, so so that's a that's a that's an opportunity for us to to fill some of that, that existing capacity. Obviously onboarding onboarding new doctors and improving patient throughput. I'll get to the patient throughput in a little bit. Um, Continue to build out our, our national network by acquiring and building new clinics. Again, as I mentioned, that you know our preference is to to acquire, but we will build new clinics when when the conditions are right. So we can so when we can co-locate with you know a group like orthopedic surgeons where they have an existing uh, patient roster that we can we can help um, improve access to care for. Release that uh, that remote pain management technology to market, and then enter the U.S. market. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the conditions that exist in Canada, almost all of the conditions that exist in Canada exist in the U S as well. Um, and so we're in active discussions with, with clinics down in the U S 
um, about uh, you know building out building out our, our U.S. network as well. In terms of growth, are there? Do you have any ambition to? I don't know, like go into different service areas like weight manage, like weight or um, other types of things, or just the market is big enough in the in the pain management. Um, sorry, I can't the X the skeletal um, acronym you, you were discussing earlier. Is that a big enough market, or do, could you see yourselves going into some other verticals? Yeah, I mean the the. Just, just back to the headline numbers, like $635 billion is the cost in the US and, and $40 billion is the cost in, in Canada just for chronic pain, um, not even for MSK conditions. Um, so there's there's a big enough opportunity there. Um, you know, right right now, I mean, I, I don't talk about our, our acquisition pipeline a lot, um, but right now we, we have, there's, there's about $70 million in revenue in, in our pipeline. Um, and, and there's and there's 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 much more than that out there as well. So there's a big enough opportunity in in uh, in pain management. We don't need to start looking at other stuff. Um, having said that, though, there you know just just because of the the interplay and you know the bio biopsychosocial approach, um, things like weight management do factor in. So some of our doctors have have actually um, worked with patients. A lot of our doctors work with patients around um, you know things like diet. Um, and, and activity because they, they do have an impact on, on pain. When you talked about your, your pipeline of what, 70 million, I, I think you said, just sort of refresh me, what's your current revenue run rate? How big is your pipeline compared to where you're at right now? Yeah, so we're, um, you know, just based on last year's numbers, plus what we've acquired this year, I think we're about $57 million revenue run rate. Okay. The, the first first nine months of the year, we've done forty five million in, in revenue. Okay, so that's a substantial tick up if if he, all of that would close and go into the business. Yep, yep, yeah. And I mean, we're 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 not a, you know we're not even talking to to you know all the potential um, opportunities out there. That's just who we're who we're in active discussions with right now, just to give you a sense of the, the size of the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, so again, capacity utilization, um, this is just what we've done historically. So back in 2017, we're sitting about 29% capacity utilization. We've got that up to 65%. Um, and we've, we've done that by onboarding new doctors, um, expanding our services and improving our patient throughput. This one is, a, is really a Canadian problem. Um, in Canada, about 20% of referrals to specialists are lost. Um, so your family doctor says, you know, I think you'd benefit from seeing a, a cardiologist or a neurologist or, you know, some other specialist, 20% of those, of those referrals just get lost. Um, we were, we were definitely seeing that, um, back in, uh, back in, in 2018. Um, when, when I joined, we were only seeing about one out of every two patients that were referred to us. Um, so these are patients whose family doctors have said, I think you would really benefit from seeing a doctor at new path. I'm going to send over a referral. We saw one out of every two. And that's um, so, just coming from the patient doesn't follow up and, and go, yeah, I'll book the next appointment. They kind of drop the ball or is there some other kind of mechanism? It's the healthcare system. It's uh, it, it was, it was us. It was us. So what we did was we, uh, we, we, we revamped our, our patient intake process and, and started tracking it. When I joined, um, I was trying to get a handle on this number. And nobody could really tell me how well we were doing. So we weren't measuring it. We weren't, it wasn't something that we were tracking. We track it now. Um, we're sitting, sitting at around 78, 78%. Um, so it's improved from that 50% to the 78%. But I know there's still further improvement in there. Um, we're never going to get to 100% because not all referrals um, are appropriate for our physicians. Um, but in some of our clinics, we're, we're sitting at 90 plus percent in terms of conversion rate. So there's still room there within, within, you know, without having to go out and find new patients, just doing, um, you know, just servicing the patients that are being referred to us. Um, you know, and again, we're sitting at 65% capacity utilization. So there's lots of room for us to, for us to grow. And when you say capacity utilization, is that sort of a, a real estate metric where you've got four doctors offices and and you could be seeing 20 patients a day per office but 
you're only seeing 15. So you're and, and if you hired a new doctor, it would make it work or, or, or just like, how do you get increase that, uh, like kind of measure it and then also increase it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So we take a look at how many exam rooms we have in each of our clinics. Um, and then, you know, through a formula, look at how many doctors we could have practicing um, and how many patients each of those doctors could see if they were practicing. And, and that's really our ceiling. You know, if, if every single room was fill, was filled with, with doctors and patients, that would be our, that would be our capacity. Um, so it, it is a, it is a real estate question, um, or a real estate exercise for sure. Gotcha. But in terms of fulfilling it, it's a both a supply and demand. You need enough patients coming in and as many and as like getting real estate's easy, getting doctors not so easy. So it's a matter of actually hiring the doctors and getting them in there waiting for the, the patients to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so again, um, growth strategy through MA, not a not a roll-up strategy. There, there is uh, you know, there's there's um, we are looking for platforms that we that we can then um, you know, add value to, uh, help them grow. The, the acquisition we completed in, uh, in February is a good example. They were, they were generating about $9 million of revenue per year when we acquired them. Um, right now, they're, they're on track to do about $12 million um, for, for 2021, so 33% growth. Um, so that's what we, that's what we look for those opportunities where, you know, it's a, it's a really well-run clinic with, with good doctors, um, where we can, we can, you know, add some, add some marketing or other management expertise or some technology to be able to help, um, fuel more, fuel more growth. Um, you know, lots of, lots of fragmentation, lots of, lots of single clinics or, or small clinics. Um, we also believe there's, there's a, there's a real gap in, in the market, both in Canada and the US, there, there is no, um, there is no leading um, group there, you know, I, I like to talk about LASIK and the success that LASIK had on the laser surgery side. Um, they, they became a verb. Um, people said they were going to, they're going to get, uh, get, get LASIK when they're, when they're going for, for surgery. Um, that doesn't exist on the inter interventional pain management side. But, so there's a real opportunity for us to, to grow and, and really fill that gap. Uh, I won't spend a ton of time here, but you know, obviously, obviously revenue, revenue is growing. Um, so in, in Q3, we reported 26% uh, year over year revenue growth. Um, and the interesting part about that is, is when we look at our same clinic revenue growth rate, um, we actually achieved 14%, 14% growth. And, and so that same clinic revenue growth is, is like a same store sales growth uh, metric that we use to say, if we had, you know, strip out the acquisition growth, if we just had our existing clinic network from from day one what would our what would our growth rate be um and, and again it's it's profitable growth so we've seen increases uh, in our in our adjusted EBITDA rate our margin there are in going back to the capacity utilization with your clinics that have been in house for more than a year or whatever number do you see higher capacity utilization in those ones as opposed to the the newly acquired ones or is there any correlation sometimes you acquire a clinic that's got great capacity utilization? Uh, I, I think that uh, it's, it's a great question. We've never, we've never really thought about it, but you know, to, to answer it from a high level, we're not looking at turnarounds when we're, when we're acquiring clinics. We're looking for clinics that are, that are you know, already operating really well, um, that you know, through you know, additional marketing or technology or, or you know, human resources or, or whatever we can add to them, um, you know, can, can grow a little bit more. So, you know, the, the, they're probably, they're probably in around our, our, our 65% capacity utilization rate, um, overall. Um, and we can, we can help them grow. Um, but it, it's something, something that we've never really thought about. Uh, in terms of cap structure, so we we have about forty six and a half million shares outstanding on a fully diluted basis. Bloom Burton owns just under 30 percent of uh, of those uh, those shares. Um, board of management own uh, about eight percent, and then the the other sixty three percent is is institutions and and other shareholders. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, who is Bloom Burton? Uh, Bloom Burton is the leading life sciences investment bank in uh, in, in Canada. 
Um, so they're, they're only focused on, uh, on, on life sciences. Um, but they, they, they own our shares through, uh, through, you know, uh, an asset management uh, or investment management company that they, they also, they also have, but they're, you know, um, investment bank, um, they do some, do some, uh, merchant banking as well. Um, and, and then some asset management, great group. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the leadership team, so, um, you know, I've uh, a, a good background in, in terms of uh, in terms of M and A um, and and healthcare, um, as well as capital markets experience. I was I was CFO for a, um, a public uh, publicly traded media company for about five years earlier in my career. Um, Jeff Zagoras, um, you know, CPA CA, um, has lots of public company experiences on the on the life sciences side. Um, ben Fagan is our is our chief technology officer. Um, and, and really from, from Ben Fagan to, to Elaine, to Bjorn, to Denise, you know, these are, these are people that we've added this year to fuel future, future growth. Um, you know, Bjorn is, uh, is really interesting. I love talking about it. They're all, they're all great, but I love talking about Bjorn because Bjorn has background um, from the four seasons. And what we've identified is a real opportunity on the patient experience side. Um, so in healthcare, you've probably experienced this as, as a consumer of healthcare, you show up to a doctor's office and office, and you get treated like you're you're lucky to be there. Um, it's a completely different different experience from you know showing up at a showing up at a Four Seasons, um, and, and we're we're working to change that. Um, we're working to change that because one, it's good for business, but two, um, it, it's it's also really important um, from a patient care perspective because patients who are actually treated better have a better patient experience actually have better outcomes. Um, so it's, it's not just about being nice to patients. It, it, you're, you're actually part of the care experience. And so we brought Bjorn on because the Four Seasons knows what they're doing in terms of, in terms of customer experience. Um, and Bjorn is working to, to you know, he's secret shopped her clinics. He's been a patient. He's gone through, you know, what our patients go through and, and is working on a training program to make sure that we offer that best possible patient experience. And that's one of the things that makes us different. Um, there aren't a lot of healthcare organizations out there thinking about patient experience. Um, the average business spends about 1.9% of revenue on, on customer experience. In healthcare, it's like 0.9%. Um, so obviously, it's, it's something that, that isn't really thought about. Um, so, so, you know, great team. Um, and and we're, we're pulling from um, other businesses and other industries to be able to, to, be able to you know, leverage what what those other industries are doing well and and, and uh, bring it into healthcare. Um, the board, you know, very similar in, in terms of uh, life sciences experience as well as capital markets experience. So Diane is our is our chair. Um, she she helped build Best Doctors and, and sold it to Teladoc for I think about five hundred million dollars. Has good experience on the on the payer side through a time at McKesson. Julian Burton, who's uh, who's the the Burton from from Bloom Burton. Um, Dan Legault is the CEO of Onti uh, Pharmaceutical. Has good experience in the payer side through his time at uh, Greenshield. Joe Wallowitz, um, again, good good experience. Uh, you know, public companies and, and pharma. Uh, Sasha is uh, is on the board of Greenbrook TMS, which is a clinic network in, down in down in the US. Um, focused on, I think it's. Uh, uh, I'm not even, not even going to try to try to unpack TMS. I forgot what it is. <laughs> um, and uh, trans, yeah. it's a trans, trans, trans magnetic stimulation. Uh, yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, Dan Chiquin has good experience with public companies and in the pharma space. And Grishant Ram is a founder of one of the one of the clinic groups that we acquired. And, and so that's it. I mean, it's a it's a a large, growing, and underserved market. Um, you know, chronic pain impacts about one in five adults worldwide, one in four people in Canada. Um, it costs more than cancer, heart disease, and HIV combined. Um, it's, we're the, the leading chronic pain management company. We've got the, the, the largest footprint in Canada. So we've got 15 clinics where we have a controlling interest and, and another two where we have, where we have a minority interest. Um, despite that, we still have significant growth opportunities. So I talked a little bit about the M&A pipeline. Um, and the opportunity to grow organically, and, and we're we're focused on both. Um, and then that that virtual care platform, so the the telemedicine combined with that proprietary remote pain management technology that we're building out, we see as a really big opportunity as well. 
With the, you have two clinics that are, in, that you have a minority interest in. What is the point of that? Is that sort of a trial, make sure you guys get along and then eventually you, you'll, you'll take a majority or a complete control or, 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 or how does it work with uh, the minority interest uh, investments? It's a great question. They're, uh, they're physio sport med clinics. Um, and, and really we're, we're trying to, we know that there's an opportunity on the physiotherapy side and you kind of alluded to this earlier that, you know, generally physiotherapy is not covered, um, under provincial, provincial health insurance plans. And, and so we're, 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 you know, by having minority interest, it gives us the opportunity to learn more about the business, but also, but also integrate it more into, into what we're doing in our, in our current clinics. We're also looking at partnership models with, with physio, physiotherapy clinics that, you know, where we can co-locate. So, you know, that, that, that whole physiotherapy um, opportunity is, is something that, something that we're investigating and having a minority interest in a couple of physiotherapy clinics allows us to get more insight into, into the business and, and how we can integrate it and, and gives us a little bit of a uh, little bit more opportunity to integrate it as well. All right. Um, with the, your potential expansion down into the U S is that a, potentially a 2022 event or is, is that further down the road? Yeah. I mean, in, in that pipeline, there are, there are us clinics um, that we're, you know, in active discussions with. So um, I would say it's a, it's a 2022 initiative. And uh, whenever Canadian companies sort of plan on expanding into the U S like, Oh, a, lo a lot of really smart people have been, uh, uh, been given a lot of humility uh, trying to do that. And, and I would think especially in the healthcare space where their financial model in the U.S. is so different than in Canada. Like you, you, you guys, the, I, the Greenbrook guys, which I think are all in the, the U.S., they would obviously be a good advisors to you on how to operate in that market. Um uh, how confident are you or, or what sort of phys uh, resources do you have uh, to make it confident that going into the U.S. would be a, a good uh, a good time, not a bad time? Yeah, it, it's a great question and something that we, we've talked about at, uh, at the board level as well. Um, you know, I, I think the difference between what we're looking to do versus what, you know, um, a, a Tim Hortons um, tried to do is that... Um, we're looking at acquiring successful businesses that have already figured out how to operate in the US. And, and that institutional knowledge comes with the acquisition. I would never say we're going to go open Greenfield, Greenfield Clinics in the US because you're absolutely right. I know how that story ends. Um, we also have, you know, as you, you alluded to it, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Sasha's on our board. Um, with, with experience at, uh, at Greenbrook. And I, I remember what TMS is, it's transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation. Um, but we also, we also have shareholders in the US who are interventional pain management doctors who've been advising us, making introductions for us. Um, so we have that, we have some of that institutional knowledge and we'd be looking to acquire more of that. We're not looking at turnarounds at Greenfields. It's, it's more about acquire successful businesses in the US or cl clinics in the US. Um, and take what they're doing and do more of it, do it, uh, you know, do it at scale. Could the U.S. model be like you start with a baby step with, I don't know, a half a dozen clinics in Minneapolis or, or something like that? Or could it potentially be a big sort of blockbuster um, uh, acquisition? Uh, any thoughts on kind of which path to go on that? Yeah, we're, we're looking at it state by state. Um, not, you don't necessarily want to be in every state from a reimbursement perspective. Yeah. Um, there are, there are better states, there are worse states. Um, we've identified the better states and are having conversations with, uh, with clinics in those, in those better states. But yeah, we, we don't want to boil the ocean, um, you know, saying we're going to be, um, across the, across the U S in, in two years makes no sense. Um, and, and nor do we need to be. I mean, the opportunity is so big in, in some, some U.S. states like the, the California economy, I think, is the seventh biggest in the world. Um, it, it's far bigger than far bigger than than Canada is. And, and so, you know, being in being in a couple of states, if you're if you're in the right states in the U.S., you can build a really big, uh, really substantial business.
Okay. Um, do have a, a question here from the, the audience. Um, is CBD uh, part of the chronic pain treatment? If it is, are you doing anything given your scale and working with insurers or Health Canada to uh, pressure the insurers to cover CBD? Uh, it is. <laughs> um, it, it absolutely is. I mean, um, medical marijuana is, is something that our doctors use as a, you know, as a tool when they feel it's appropriate, similar to, um, you know, any other, any other drug. Um, we don't have, um, we don't have a horse in that race though. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of, um, any financial incentives. Um, I think that's really important, really important to make clear because, um, you know, that there's, there, there, there are some, there are some clinics out there that, uh, that do receive financial incentives from, um, from the, uh, from the LPs, the, the cannabis, cannabis manufacturers. It's a, it's a menu option for physicians that can, that they can use when they feel it's appropriate for, um, patients. We don't have an active lobby in terms of in terms of trying to get insurers to uh, to to cover, um, you know, cannabis or or, or CBD. Um, I know that there are some insurance plans that actually that actually do cover it, um, but it's it's not uh, that's not that's not our fight. So cannabis is part of your your physician's toolkit. That's if it makes sense, they'll they'll prescribe that. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Um. So it is, uh, are all the markets, the provincial markets in Canada, potential targets for your growth strategy as well? Or like the U.S., some states are more attractive uh, than others. Are there some provinces maybe with higher or lower densities uh, that uh, could be more or less of interest to you? Yeah, I mean, we, we look at... Um, having a national network being important and, and really it's, it's important, um, from an employer perspective, I've, I've talked about our ambitions to, to, to start generating more revenue for, by working with employers to help them save, save costs. Um, and, and so our view of a national network would be, um, would be, you know, a presence in BC around, uh, you know, around Vancouver, um, and maybe maybe a couple of other markets. I mean, the, the Okanagan is is a is a good market in terms of demographics. Um, Alberta, we think that we have pretty good coverage there with with Edmonton, Red Deer. Um, we we probably want a clinic in in Calgary. Um, Winnipeg is a is a is a potential location. We've got Ontario covered. We cover about sixty seven percent of the Ontario population. Um, Quebec. We feel like uh, feel like there's there's an opportunity in in, uh, in the Montreal area, um, and then potentially something in the in the you know maybe in Halifax um, would be would be another opportunity. But yeah, we don't feel like we need to be in in every single province, um, but we do want to have that national network. When you're acquiring clinics in Canada, a lot of them are, I, I think. Um, they kind of owner operated the, the chief doctor is also his business. Maybe he's got a couple of partners and so forth. Uh, they may not be professionally run with a professional manager. It's like the head doctor sort of half the time he's managing and the other half he he's seeing patients and, and so forth. Um, uh, I'm not sure what my question is. It, it, what, can you give us some perspective on that or, or some of the dynamics associated with that? Do, do, are they like, great, we can be acquired? Uh, I'm a doctor. I like helping patients. I don't want to be uh, hiring uh, uh, receptionists or nurses or whatever. I'd love to pass that off to the new PATH platform. Uh, could you discuss that a bit? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, if, you, if you spoke with, uh, with one of the nine um, physician owners from the acquisition in, in February, they would tell you absolutely that was one of the one of the drivers behind their decision to become part of New Path was that um, they wanted to get back to being doctors, uh, and, and that doesn't mean that they're no longer involved in the in you know in, in business decisions. In fact, some of the doctors are actually probably more involved in 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 the business. It's that they don't have to deal with the you know the day to day nonsense. Um, you know that the, the um, this person's off sick or, or this person you know that. You know, we're, we're having troubles recruiting for a CLXD. We we take care of that, and so that's absolutely 
Um, one of the one of the nice things from a from a physician owner perspective that that we can bring. It's also a huge opportunity if you think about it from a competitive perspective. Um, we're competing with clinics that that really don't have a professional management team, and then you know, in general, in healthcare, we're not we're not building professional management. There there really is nowhere for uh, you know for professional managers to 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 go and to and, and to learn and develop their skills. I think back to GE a while ago when when Jack Welch was there, and that used to be viewed as you know kind of a training ground for professional management. We don't have that in healthcare in Canada. Um, and, and that's what that's what we're trying to do at at New Path in, in bringing people from the Four Seasons and bringing people from Bell Media and bringing people from you know these these other successful organizations, um, injecting some talent because um, it, it absolutely puts us at a competitive advantage to uh, to a clinic that is you know being run part time by by physicians who really should be spending more you know spending their time with with patients. Um, and so from an acquisition perspective, it's good, but also from a competitive perspective, it's good to be able to have that professional management team in place. In the Canadian market, are you, when you're talking to a clinic or some clinics uh, about acquiring them, are there competitive pressures? Like within the last few years, it's really been remarkable, I think, in Canada, where it's gone from just all these owner operator um, doctor's offices to uh, you've got well health and TELUS involved in the in the healthcare industry now. Are you having to bid against other people, uh, uh, other larger uh, sort of medical groups uh, in that? No, I mean occasionally we've had we've had conversations where somebody said, you know, I was approached by X Y Z um, group. Um, you know the the. Uh, the group that we acquired in in February, um, they were a couple of years ago. They were they were in you know they'd been approached by by one of the one of the much larger healthcare healthcare organizations, and they said, you know what, it, it's it doesn't work for us. Um, you know, so I, I think that there's I think it's um, it's not something we we see where we're you know we're getting in, into competitive processes. Um, every once in a while, somebody will say, oh, I spoke with, spoke with this group. Um, but I, you know, I think that we have a number of advantages versus, you know, some of the, the much, much larger organizations. I'm not, I, I've never interviewed those, those bigger healthcare companies. They're more sort of GP folks that they, they don't have the same kind of uh, niche and focus that you do. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, very, very family practice based. Um, you know, there's some some that have gotten a little bit more into into the the mental health space, but what we're doing is very different and much more focused. Um, so that's probably a you know a good explanation for why we don't really cross paths with them. And when you do acquisitions, is there a standard kind of multiple so much times EBITDA or per doctor or for revenue base or, or any kind of numbers we should be kind of looking out for on that? There isn't really. I mean, um, when, when, we, when we made the acquisition in February, we looked at it from an, from an IRR perspective. So we had, you know, put Put together some forecasts for the for the the, the business, um, and, and you know looked at looked at what we we're we we're looking to pay, and we came out with an IR. I think it was I think it was about thirty one percent, and that's more of our focus um, as opposed to multiples. Um, and there's a good reason for that. If we had of um, if we had of look if we if we looked at the acquisition in February from a pure multiple perspective, particularly from a you know multiple of EBITDA. We probably wouldn't have done the deal, um, but what we saw was that they were um, they had they had these opportunities to to grow, and and the business the business was going to have a much better twenty twenty one than a than a twenty twenty, and it's proved out. Um, and, and so, um, looking at it from an IRR perspective, actually worked out much much better for us, um, and that's our preferred method. So we don't have, you know, we we need to we need to. We need to buy at you know this multiple of EBITDA or this multiple of revenue, um, because that's not what we're doing. We're not. It's not a. It's not a. Um, it's not buy at buy at eight times EBITDA and get credit eleven times. We're not. We're not playing in that arbitrage game. We really are looking at looking for platforms to to grow and build out on. 
And, and I, I want to circle back to that. You talked earlier about sort of where you're not a roll up in terms of uh, roll ups being, hey, we're at 10 times and we can buy guys at five times. And then that we just get we capture that lift. You, you're talking about the platform. You buy a company, you, you buy a business and you help improve it and you get synergies uh, across the platform. It's not just uh, like the financial arbitrage, what you just mentioned. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay, well, we're uh, well into an hour on this, so uh, we should be wrapping it up, Grant. So thank you very much. Any final comments? And also sort of one last thing, we've hit on a few points, but what kind of news flow should uh, investors be expecting uh, over the next uh, three to six months or so? I guess some acquisitions, new technology, any other types of things that in that realm? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's really about um, expanding our clinic network, whether it's via acquisition or you know s similar deals like the the Red Deer deal that we we just announced. Um, so yeah, so look for us to 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 continue to expand that network, um, expand expanded services, and and absolutely technology. Um, you know, that's that's going to be a big part of our story moving forward as well. Thank you very much for taking the time to tell us the New Path story. Uh, have a great day. Have great holidays. I hope you rest up and have a, a good 2022. Thanks, Martin. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to have me and, uh, and happy holidays to you and, and everybody on the webinar.